In the global fight against COVID-19, it's mutations that are proving the next great challenge. And here in the UK, authorities are taking that fight directly into people's homes. Guys, let's go. They're doing door-to-door -door COVID testing in areas where new mutations have been found. The goal, to identify cases before they have a chance to spread. It was just one case of the South African variant found here in this community that launched this door-to-door -door testing scheme. But the concern is that one case could just be the tip of the iceberg. Ordinarily, only a small amount of positive COVID tests are screened for mutations, meaning that when they are found, authorities here are cracking down hard. It's thanks to genome sequencing that authorities can pinpoint where to look. The UK is the world leader in sequencing, analysing 10% of positive COVID samples for the emergence of new variants. In total, the team at the UK's COVID-19 Genomics Consortium is responsible for almost half the world's coronavirus sequencing. Work that will continue to prove crucial as more mutations emerge. I don't think we've seen the full spectrum of mutations that could arise. So the variant that's common in England at the moment, the 117, that's very good at spreading. But actually what I'm looking for very carefully is mutations going into that variant that also impact on immunity. And that's what starts to worry me considerably. And that is what we're seeing in, in the UK. But no population is immune to mutations. That's why Professor Peacock says genome sequencing needs to become a global priority. Without comprehensive international screening, it's feared new, more dangerous variants could take hold, putting vaccine programmes at risk. Mutations will be in the four corners of the earth. And there'll be lots that we don't know about that we'd be quite concerned if we did know about. Now, the reason that's important for all of us is because some of these variants are actually going to lead to a challenge in terms of immunisation. Now, that is, is really critical as we go forward. We need to know what the virus is doing so that we can keep up with uh, vaccine development. Work is already being done to modify vaccines to protect against existing variants. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm optimistic. Professor Paul Heath is the chief investigator of the UK's Novavax vaccine trial. He says he's confident sequencing can help manufacturers keep ahead of mutations. One of the beauties of the, the vaccine technologies or platforms that we're seeing now uh, in the production of COVID-19 vaccines is that they are very uh, efficient and flexible. And, and, and so it's entirely possible now that um, modified vaccines will emerge very quickly from the, uh, these different vaccine manufacturers. Vaccines will likely have to adapt. In the meantime, identifying and isolating mutations will be an invaluable tool in the cat and mouse game between vaccines and variants. Well, my next guest tonight is an epidemiologist and a professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Caitlin Rivers has co-authored many of the reports on the pandemic that have become a primer for the Biden administration's COVID-19 response. Dr. Rivers joins me tonight from Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Rivers, it's good to have you on the program. As you just saw in that report, the world is now focused on the coronavirus variants and the weapon that we have right now, since, since the, we don't know if the vaccines are going to work, are face masks. And I understand the CDC has now said that one is maybe not enough. That's right. The two things that we know that can help to improve mask performance are filtration and fit. And so CDC is now recommending that people consider adding a second mask, wearing two masks, or ensuring that their masks fit snugly around their mouth, because these two things will help to protect other people and also help to protect the wearer. And so we're getting this advice. We're, we're worried about the variants. And it comes at a time when the U.S. remains on a course for half a million COVID-19 deaths by next month, correct? That's right. Unfortunately, we have suffered an enormous loss of life, particularly during the severe winter surge. The good news is we are now coming down from the peak of that winter surge. Things are improving. Cases have fallen substantially, and we expect uh, new deaths to fall as well. But there's no question that it has been an enormous tragedy. Yeah, I was looking at your Twitter feed. You tweeted last week that it is painfully obvious now that there are no guarantees that things will improve continuously. 
Does, does that negate the promise that the public has, the faith that the public has right now in the vaccines? Not at all. I think the vaccines are an amazing innovation and they will be the tool that will help us to get out of this crisis. But in the United States right now, only three to 4% of people are fully vaccinated. That's a good start, but it's not enough to stop the virus from circulating. There is a possibility that things could again worsen. They're improving right now, but if we are not vigilant about continuing to wear masks, to social distance, to avoid gatherings, they could worsen again. And so I do think people need to continue to stay the course while we continue that vaccine rollout campaign. And, and how do you see the variants impacting then the timeline, the time horizon when we're talking about the rest of this pandemic? I mean, will the pandemic automatically be longer because of these variants? I am concerned about the variants. Places where they have become established and started to circulate widely have had a difficult time. Uh, because in the United States, we are a little bit further along in the timeline with our vaccine campaign relative to when we expect to face the variants, I think we have a little bit of an advantage. I'm hoping, hoping that we won't see the severe surge that the UK saw, for example. But there's no question that this is an added challenge that we're going to need to be responsive to. And so I am concerned and uh, keeping a careful eye on how things unfold. How do you see the, the vaccine and the variants playing out? Uh, I'm wondering, will the vaccine be like a, a flu vaccine that we have to get once a year? But also knowing that if we don't get the flu vaccine, um, you know, we're not risking our lives. Will it be that way or will it be a vaccine that we have to get every year if we want to save our lives? I do think it will be likely that the vaccine will need to be updated, much like the flu vaccine, whether it's every year or every three years. I don't think we quite know yet, but now that we understand that variants are playing an important role in the epidemiology, we will likely need to update our defenses. I do hope that with widespread vaccination, we can get to the point where the, the pandemic does not threaten us like it does now, mm -hmm. where we're able to return to our normal lives, but vaccines will continue to play an important role in that. I know you support the creation of a national center for epidemic forecasting, similar to the way the National Weather Service um, forecasts hurricanes. Pandemics and viruses are a part of national security, yet the public and politicians don't equate pandemic preparedness with tanks and fighter jets. Why is that? There's a saying we have in public health that it's a panic neglect cycle. After something happens, we realize we can't wait for crises to hit in order to mount a response. We need to have a standing capability to prepare. And I think that's what this National Center for Epidemic Forecasting and Outbreak Analytics would be. It would help us to anticipate threats, to get our response in order before they become a crisis. And I think as this pandemic has showed us, that's really badly needed. And before I let you go, do you think that it's a given that there will be another pandemic sooner rather than later? You know, these events happen a lot more than people realize. We have faced uh, anthrax attacks in 2001, SARS in 2003. I could go on and on, but it's about every two years that there is a fairly serious crisis. And so I do think we need to update our understanding and expectations that we need to prepare and we need to anticipate and we need to be prepared to contain things before they grow into pandemics. All right, Dr. Caitlin Rivers with Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Rivers, it's good talking with you. We appreciate your time and your insights tonight. Thank you. Thank you.